Well, hey, Calvary, I am not able to be with you this morning, but I am so excited about what God's gonna do in this service and in your life. You, you know we've been in what we call our Life Change Initiative. And we've been talking about not only God's vision for our church, but also his vision for your life. And, and we've been talking about th this whole thing using the image of a tree, and we've been talking about our roots. A few weeks ago, we started talking about the first root, which is God first, how God is the most important thing in everything in our lives. The second root was about our passion, and when that passion is in us, it flows through us. And we talked about this for our church. Our passion is that people are the priority. God loves people, and so we love them too. The third root that we talked about last week was that healthy things grow. And we talked about what it means to be fruitful and to thrive, not only in our own lives, but also in the, in the life of the church. Next week, we're gonna talk about our fourth route, which is we get to do this. And next week is our Vision Sunday. This is gonna be a Sunday unlike anyone that we've ever had before, and you are not going to want to miss it. It is gonna be a celebration of God's faithfulness to this church in our lives, in the past, present, and into the future. I can't wait to share with you more next Sunday, so be with us next Sunday for our Vision Sunday. Also, th through this process, we've been talking about the expansion that Calvary's leadership believes that God is leading us to, to extend our building out and to add a new larger auditorium. Now I know there's probably a lot of questions about this, so that's why we're having these special information meetings. We're gonna have them on Tuesday and Thursday this week, the 11th and 13th at 7 p.m., as well as on the 15th, Saturday morning at 10 a.m. And if you have questions, come on out and join us. We're gonna talk about the construction, we're gonna talk about the, the architecture, what it looks like. We'll answer some of the questions that you might have about finances and even give you an opportunity, if you want to, to take kind of a little virtual reality tour of the facility and what it's gonna look like. If you wanna to come to one of those info meetings, make sure you sign up. You can do it out at the Hub today, you can do it online, or you can do it on the Toledo Calvary app and let us know you're gonna join us for these really important meetings and this time together. I also wanna to talk to you just a little bit about the, the financial side of this whole project. You know, each week we've been talking a little bit more about the giving. Our hope is that you will pray about what God would have for you to do. We believe that God's gonna bring the resources necessary for us to be able to move forward with this project, but he chooses to do it through me and through you. The, the principle we talk about is called the PLOW principle. That's P-L-O-W. The P stands for pray. And we pray and ask God, what would you have for me to do? God, it may be supernatural, but I'll, I'll do it. The letter L stands for listen. That after we pray, we, we listen to what he puts in our heart. And then the letter O is that we obey. And we say, God, I'll be faithful to do what you've put in my heart to do. The letter W in PLOW is to watch because we really believe that when you pray, listen, and obey, you're gonna watch and see how God not only supplies through you, but then does miraculous things in your life as well. When you might say, well, well, how will I give? What does that look like? We're asking everyone that calls Calvary their church home to consider making a two-year pledge to this life change initiative. God, how would you have for me over the course of the next two years to sacrificially give to see this project come to fruition? We really believe that as you pray and consider your finances and what God would have for you to do, He's gonna lead you to an amount that he'll put in your heart to say, I'm gonna pledge this, that over the course of these next two years, I'm gonna sacrificially and generously give to see God move this endeavor forward. Over the next two weeks, the 16th and the 23rd, and you can do it online as well, we're gonna give you the opportunity to make that pledge as you pray about this, as you, you get insight and wisdom from your family and you talk to your spouse and determine what God would have for you to do, and make that two-year pledge towards this endeavor. To start that pledge then, on the 23rd of February, we're gonna ask you to bring an offering, kind of that first part of your pledge, that you would bring the best offering that you can as God leads, and give it on the 23rd to watch and see how God, through us, is gonna miraculously provide to move this project forward. Thanks for praying about this and, and seeking God's wisdom and direction as we pray and plan to see what God's gonna do in this time. Well, I'm really disappointed that I'm not here today at Calvary because I know that you are in for a treat. Today, our guest is Matt Hammett. And if you don't know Matt, I am so excited to introduce him to you. I've known Matt for over 20 years. And when Matt was a teenager, he grew up here in our youth group at Calvary Church, a part of those activities and, and leading worship. I can remember when Matt was a young man and praying that God would provide a recording contract for him and the band that he was a part of. And I can remember watching his 
God gave so much influence and opportunity to minister to others through Sanctus Real and Matt's role in that incredible music group. I can remember praying with Matt and Sarah in seasons of, of health challenges in their family and remember standing with them and believing that God was gonna lead them as they moved into transitioning new seasons of ministry. It's exciting to see how God is using Matt and opening up new doors of opportunity. Today, you're gonna have the opportunity to buy his brand new book. We're the first people to be able to get our hands on it and I can't wait for you to pick one up and see how God's gonna use that. And I know that God is gonna use Matt today to speak a word from God to our church for this moment, for this season that we're in. We are honored to have Matt Hammett with us today. I'm a big fan. And so Calvary, would you stand to your feet and would you take this moment and give a great big Calvary welcome to our friend, Matt Hammett. Hey. Wow, thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Awesome. It's good to be here. Wow. So awesome. Um, man. What? Oh. Uh, oh, thank you very much. Wow. Appreciate that. Well, I love you too. You guys are awesome. Um, so today's an exciting day uh, because I'm here. As you know, I, I grew up at Calvary. Most of you know that. Some of you, you know, as you've trickled in over the past few years, uh, maybe don't know that. But I, I grew up here. I live in Nashville, Tennessee now with my wife, Sarah, and her four kids. And we're all excited today because my wife, Sarah, her sister, Hannah, just gave birth to her first baby like 30 minutes ago, right down the road. So we are going to get over there and, and see uh, the baby. We're going to have a fun field trip to see new baby Bennett this afternoon. So this is exciting. And I get to be at Calvary with all of you. Uh, last night, I was at dinner with a couple friends. Uh, well, a friend and his wife, I mean, Sarah, were there. And we were talking, you know, every time we come back to town, we always see all kinds of people we know. So the whole time, we were like seeing people. And I'm, oh, hey, how's it going? And hugging people. And, you know, I'm, I'm back around. It's nice. Uh, at the end of dinner, my friend looks at our waitress and points at me. And she said, he says, uh, hey, I, I just wanted you to know that thing I said about him being freshly out of prison, it was a joke. Uh, <laughs> so the whole time, she thinks literally I'm fresh out of prison. All right? And I'm like seeing everybody, you know, for the first time in a while. And so then it led me to this question like, if you really thought this whole time, I like, like I, I just get out of prison. Like, what did you think I was serving time for? You know, and, and Bob asked her, he's like, yeah, what were you thinking? You're looking at him. And she was like, oh, I don't know. She's like, I was thinking maybe like, maybe this guy served time for like financial crimes or something. You know, and I was like, I was relieved because I was afraid she was going to say like I looked like a serial killer or something, you know? And so that's, so one, really, that's, that's a good sign for this, uh, this new nephew of mine that when I go see him today, I won't look too scary. So anyways, that, I thought that was kind of a funny thing that happened last night. Um, never been in that situation before. So something new every, every time I come back to town. Uh, but seriously, and speaking of new, this right here is a book I've been working on for so long. Um, I'm not going to do a big advertisement for it. I'm going to mention this now because I want to get it out of the way and move on to this. But what I will say is um, this book is not just my story. It's not just some lessons I've learned along the way. The heart of this, uh, it, it's just more than that to me because 20 million kids in America are living without a father right now. And there are so many broken marriages, as you know. You know, one out of every two marriages really does end in divorce, a lot of times even in the church. And so we're just in a place right now where I think more than ever, we need good men to step up and be leaders of our families. And, um, and I'm on that journey with guys, not to shame guys, but to walk with them and say, hey, let's celebrate who we are, who God has designed us to be. We all have the same struggles, but we can navigate this tension between career dreams and family dreams and being the people that God has called us to be. And so that's what this is about. If you want to support that message, uh, please take time to stop by, grab them from the lobby. If you don't, you can get it online. Um, and the, the best thing you could do is just tell people about it. Tell people about it. That would mean so much to me. Um, so, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to start. I'm actually going to read something out of here. But before I do, um, 
I speak at a lot of men's and marriage conferences around the country now. It's primarily what I do. Um, and, and so it's easy for me to kind of mix and match because I don't speak in the same place that much. So two things. It's easy for me to kind of mix and match things I'm comfortable talking about and try to package it for, you know, if I'm coming to Calvary, what can I say that maybe something I've already prepared. Um, but God laid a fresh word on my heart this morning for Calvary that I really wrestled through this week, and I'm, I'm excited um, I'm excited to talk about it. And secondly, as I was doing that, as I was going through this message this week and trying to figure out, okay, God, how do I communicate what you've put on my heart? Because it's, 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 a, it's a process. Um, and then me think of your pastor, Pastor Chad, who week in and week out prepares fresh messages that God is laying on his heart um, for this church. Aren't you so grateful to have a pastor like him? He's incredible. I love his heart, his humility, his messages, and I'm so excited about um, what God is going to do with this new building project. I was going to share this story later, but I'm actually going to share it right now um, because it has to do with giving, and it has to do with the fact with, with Pastor Chad just sharing about this, this financial ask. And um, it, it's hard sometimes for pastors to ask because we, we don't want to turn people away, right? But it's like, the, it's like anything can't exist or thrive without people giving to what they believe in. And so it's hard to ask. And, and I know Chad, he considers it a privilege to ask because the project is really important. And, and, and I was reminded even watching him of when I was sitting in the seats at Calvary back on Glendale when I was growing up here. And, um, and I was actually a newly married guy in 2001. And I was sitting in a service, and there was uh, uh, somebody from the, the missions board at Calvary sharing about um, what we wanted to do to reach out and help people who are in poverty and hurting in different parts of the world and some of the missions that we wanted to go on as a church. They asked us to, to get involved and do a six-month campaign where we gave for six months. And they asked, you know, what would God put on your heart to give? And at that time, I just left any of the random jobs I've been doing as a rock and roll guy trying to make it with my band and to go full time on the road, to go with my brand new wife, Sarah, we were going to go on the road together in this 15 passenger van and a trailer and, and give up pretty much everything to live on the road and chase this dream. God bless my wife for doing that with me back then. And Jody, you were with us too. Man, you, you were there. And uh, I'm so grateful that these women in our lives were willing to make these sacrifices. They did not go unseen. Um, and, but I'll tell you, we were making $800 a month. OK, so and I had to pay for an apartment, pay for food. We're at Calvary. We're hearing about the heart of this new mission project. And I told Sarah, I reached over, I said, hey, I think God's calling us to give. And she kind of like got that nervous look on her face, like, when do we have money? We already tied, you know? Like, what are you talking about here? And I said, I'm thinking $100 a month. And she just like, like her eyes. I mean, at that time, it was like a lot of money for us. And she like, she said, you know what? I'm going to trust it. We're going to go with it. So for six months, we give $100 a month. And at the end of that six months, our insurance company, our health insurance company, and I've, I've never, I don't even to this day understand how this happened, why it happened. It's never happened to me again. But our insurance company that we had been buying medical insurance from, I don't even know it went public or private or something happened where they said, hey, you're shareholders, and we're sending you your shareholder check for $600. <laughs> and so in that, I saw like we made a huge sacrifice. But in that, God showed us that he was right there with us in it, providing every step of the way. And I know as you guys walk into this new project that if you're feeling in your heart that God's calling you to give, that he's right there with you every step of the way. He'll honor that gift. He'll honor that decision. Um, the message I want to I wanna share today um, the title I gave it was The Invitation of Hope. The Invitation of Hope. And I want to read just a couple paragraphs from the opening of the first chapter of my book, Lead Me. They called me the Barf King. Not the sort of cool name an elementary school kid hopes for. Certainly not ace or lucky or something fast athletic kids get like Flash. Those would have been good nicknames. But when you're a first grader with a nervous stomach, 
who upchucks in front of the water fountain while your classmates are lined up to get a drink? Barf King it is. I can't recall who blessed me with such a clever nickname. Maybe the janitor whispered it around the halls as payback for all the times he had to carry his push broom and sack of red sawdust to the scene of my latest spew. Boy, that guy must have hated me. I grew up in a neighborhood just northwest of downtown Toledo, only a mile away from the hospital where I was born. I rolled with a small gang of neighborhood kids and a few friends at church where the Hammett family could be found most any time the doors were open. Most of my early memories share the same location, Toledo Christian School, or TCS, the private Christian academy I attended from kindergarten through 12th. Our mascot was the eagle, and bold letters across the gymnasium wall reminded every student of the promise in Isaiah 40, 31. Those who hope, hope, those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Those who hope meant that with God's help, even the barf king could soar. I believed those words back then, and despite the staggering number of students I meet who seem proudly jaded by their Christian school experience, I still believe those words today. I still believe those words today, that those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. How many people have felt weary? Anybody ever feel weary? Ever feel weak? I most certainly do. It's impossible not to be a human being on the face of this planet and not feel tired and weary and worn out. Um, you know, it's, it's different things. When I was a kid, I remember just trying to find my place in the world. I was, you know, I had a little bit of, of bullying here and there early in school, and, and that made it hard for me. Um, and then I tried to, I kind of lost myself at times trying to fit in with different groups of people and trying to know where I belonged. And now as adults, so often we lose ourselves in the grind Right? The attempt of daily life of just trying to do this thing of balancing tension between work dreams and family dreams and everything else we want to accomplish in life and feeling like we're so far behind on even some of the little things that we just want to get done it can be so hard to catch your breath. Sometimes it's my kids fighting about Fortnite, you know, that wears me down. Anybody else deal with that issue? I see you, buddy. It's all right. I love it. You're good at it, by the way. Lewis is down here. He's like, Dad, what are you talking about? He's like, don't take my Fortnite away. All right. All right. We'll talk about it later. So, you know, it's all these little things, all these little things in our lives. It can be the smallest, most silly thing that we're trying to navigate at any given moment that can just be that last little straw that breaks our back, the weight, the burden. You know, growing up at Calvary, I think about some of the challenges that we face, um, that we have faced over the years. And some of you have been here long enough to have weathered many changes. For those of you who haven't, I want you to know that this church has been built on uh, generations of faithful people who served and who stuck around through really hard times. I remember multiple times that we lost pastors. I remember um, a, a really bad church split we had not too long after we came to this church when I was a kid. And, and then again, after that, I remember the disappointment of seeing several other pastors leave. And people would, would splinter off. And many of you have been part of church splits where it's just such a, a sad, I'll just say sad, thing to go through. And, and, and one of the most important things for me one of the greatest gifts in my life was that I had parents who never put their faith in people. They put their faith in God. They served this church, and they served its people through every painful transition. And even though they told us the truth through it all, you know, and, and, and I've carried that on, telling, telling your kids the truth about things, they told us the truth, but they never spoke an ill word of anyone that I can remember they remain faithful to God and to each other and to the people that make up this great church, Calvary. I'm so grateful for parents who had that kind of faith. Christians were, were kind of crazy sometimes. We're kind of crazy. 
because, you know, we get hurt and, and uh, we get wounded and we still stick around. And even though we may feel bitterness, sometimes we want to blame God or people, we struggle through those feelings, um, we, we cling on to this hope that allows us to find forgiveness. We cling on to this hope that we find in Christ that allows us to keep moving on. We find this hope that allows us to soar on wings as eagles, to run and not grow faint, even though we've been wounded over and over and over again. Where does this hope come from? This resilience. It's because we know this. Romans 5, 1 through 5. Since we have been justified through faith, We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we've gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. So we've come to grace. We found peace in God through Christ. And now we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings. That sounds crazy, right? Glory in our sufferings? What does that even mean? But here's here's more of what we know, according to Paul, because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit who's been given to us. Glory in our sufferings. Sounds like a real crazy concept for people who don't know hope the way that we've come to know it in Christ. There's an extreme example of hope that I was hesitant to bring up today, but I couldn't stop thinking about it. As I kept talking about hope, I couldn't stop thinking about it because this was a recent thing that happened. There was a big church in California. Some of you will know what I'm talking about. Uh, A big church in California where one of their worship leaders lost a child, tragically. So sad. And then Two days went by, and three days went by. And on social media, they were calling on people to pray that their child would be brought back to life. And you know, I was like, wow, man, these, that's a lot of faith. That's a lot of hope. And I had mixed feelings about it. Because right, like, OK, well, where is our hope? Is it, is it in this life or the next? And, and, and what's, I mean, I, there were so many questions I had. And then four days, five days, six days, seven days goes. And they're still saying, we're still believing the entire church together, praying, worshiping every day, believing for this miracle. And the reason I bring this up is because this, no matter where you stand on the spectrum of how you feel about, about this, um, it forced me to ask myself a question. It forced me to ask myself, how much hope do I have? How much hope do I have? Do I still believe that God can do anything? Yes. Do I believe that God is good even when he doesn't answer our prayers? Absolutely. So what do I care if hurting parents decide that they want to pray and petition God for their child to come back to life? It looks crazy to the world, but does God need me to save his brand by playing the sane evangelical PR guy? Ah, uh, he doesn't need me. And I got to thinking, what is it about this that makes, I've got to ask myself, and I want you to ask yourself, how much hope do you have? <laughs> Tough question. People need hope. Have you noticed that it's an election year? Anybody notice that? I don't know. You know, it's uh, every time it comes around, we're all in some sort of pain. We see everybody's pain. And look, I'm going to tell you, I pray for the president every single day. Um, but I know this. I know this. Our hope is not in any president or in politics or in people. It is not. It is not. Our hope is in God. Our hope is in God. Yes, do we hope for a different, or out, an outcome, or do we want to see certain things in our country uh, policies furthered? Of course we do. But you know what? In the end, no matter who you vote for, your hope should not be in a president or politics. It should be only found in God. If your hope is elsewhere, then you've got to deal with that, because you're going to be constantly disappointed. 
You'll be, no matter what side you're on, you will be disappointed if that's where your hope is. But during these election cycles, we see people who all of these passions and all of these longings and all the things they desire for themselves and their families in this country all come to the forefront. And we begin to see this thing, uh, this longing. And it reminds me of Proverbs 12, 13 that says, hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a longing fulfilled is a tree of life. When I heard Chad on the video talking about using the illustration of a tree and the roots, it made me think of this. It made me think of all the years I grew up at Calvary and watched all the transitions and watched how my life was shaped by Pastor Bill McGinnis and my parents and all the pastors here at Calvary who, who were just kept pouring in through all the transitions and all the different pains that we felt. It didn't come easy. There were times where I remember where the church felt sick with longing that God would just do something. And here we are. It's a tree. It's a longing being fulfilled that God is bringing a new and fresh season to this church where you can have more ability to share hope with the world that needs it. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. And I want to tell you, if you never find Jesus, you stay sick forever. You stay sick forever because he's the fulfillment of hope. See, that sickness is part of the human condition as long as we are in this life and we treat the sickness with, with the wrong medication. Even as believers, we say we have hope, we do have hope. Even if we walk with Christ and we're involved in this body and we are committed to building the church, in this world, there will be a thousand ways to medicate our sickness. Every single day, we're bombarded with an endless stream of inspirational quotes and the desire to be loved and the desire to be liked. And I get there too. And it's hard and it's a fight every single day not to get absorbed into all the knowledge and information and everything that comes at us every single day that tries to tell us how we can be whole and healthy. You know, that wholeness is it's, it's the wholeness. And even when it comes to things like, I don't know, down in Nashville, where I'm from, it's an artist community and everybody's really into the Enneagram right now. I don't know. Do you guys know the Enneagram up here? I think so. Yeah, I'm assuming, but you just never know. You know, these things go in waves. And so, like, but some people are like, that's like their religion. Like, I look at it like, man, that's an awesome tool we can use to understand ourselves and the people we love, but that can't be our religion. Essential oils, man, mm, they smell good. I used them last night on my throat to help me out, but it can't be your religion. You can't find wholeness in these peripheral things. Sure, they're the evil, no, but you're not going to find your wholeness and your hope in those things. And I met this guy. And we started talking. I was talking about the fact that we live uh, in, in a culture that's high on the idea of hope, but hostile to the truth that supports it. I want to say that again. We live in a culture that is high on the idea of hope, but hostile to the truth that supports it. And so we were talking about this. I'd never met this guy before. And he said something to me. He said a few things to me that really... I could not stop thinking about. We started talking about wholeness versus holiness. And there's this epidemic that's infiltrated our churches, and I see it everywhere I go. It's this battle between wholeness and holiness, right? See, wholeness, this idea of I want all the knowledge, and I want it right now, and I'm going to seek this knowledge that will help me be a whole person that's right here, that's in your head. Holiness that comes from God, that we receive from him, that's in your heart. So wholeness and holiness. He spoke that word, and I was like, man, I was just listening to everything he said. And he said, wholeness wants all of it now, right? But faith can start with a seed. And it grows. God makes it grow. And this is the thing he said that really, just like, it got me. He said, the pursuit of wholeness will never make you holy, but the pursuit of holiness will always make you whole. That's true. 
because only our creator can fulfill the work that he designed his creation for. It's a puzzle piece that fits together, and when we're missing it, we're going somewhere else, there's always something missing. We cannot be complete. In this culture, here's the thing, more and more, we are forced to decide if we are going to bow or serve or look for our fulfillment in culture or creator. They're always at odds, culture or creator. See, but hope that comes from God is more than just some new philosophy or formula or financial investment. Hope that comes from God calls us to do some radical things. And that's why I call this the invitation of hope, okay? Because there are are levels to this. We can come to no hope, but there's a greater invitation than just for it to come into our lives so we can have it and and hold it. There's another step in all this. I use this when I go to men's conferences and and a lot of marriage conferences. I talk about good intentions. I talk about all the things that we want to do, but we don't do. So intentions versus action. And I think today I wanted, I felt like it would really work for hope too. And so um, I bought this and it's just, you know, workout dice. You throw it on the ground and um, whatever comes up, you're supposed to do it. It's supposed to help you work out, inspire you, I guess. A piece of rubber to inspire you. Uh, and so I bought it because I'm like, all right, man, I got I to gotta do something here. I was gaining a few pounds, and it rolled out of the bag in the back seat of my car. It's sitting in the back seat. And for, uh, for two months, this just sat in the back of my car. And every time I looked at it, I saw like 30 sit-ups, you know? And guess what? Here's the thing. I felt pretty good about myself. Because what was I doing? I was doing 30 sit-ups right here. I was like imagining myself like, oh, yeah, I got that workout dice, man. That's awesome. 30 sit-ups. I need to do that I'm, right now. I'm, I'm feeling it. OK? And then I realized, like, this is ridiculous. Like, I've got to do something with this thing, you know? And so I brought it in the house. I put it in the mudroom. And I look at it again. And it's like, you know, 20 push-ups. And in my mind, I'm just like, every day I'm doing 20 push-ups and right here. You know, it's like I'm in, I've got this film reel of me doing 20 push-ups and sit-ups. And in my mind, I'm getting ripped on good intentions. I've been working out for four months. <laughs> but nothing has changed. Nothing has changed. The craziest thing about this is that it has the ability to lead me into something that changes my life and changes the world around me. This can change people's lives in in, in a way. (laughs) But imagine this is hope. And so many of us, I really feel like we get this thing called hope or faith, and we we hold on to it, and we feel pretty good about it. And we're like, we got stuff around our house. Like, I'm walking through my house, and I'm like, yeah, man, God's good. I I see my Bible sitting on my end table, and I see it. And I'm like imagining myself reading it a little more. It's there. It makes me feel good. I've got my prayers on the wall. I've got my bookshelf with my Christian living section. And I see it every day. And it makes me feel like, look, I got my Christian living section. And it's like, I got my stuff, man. I've got it. I'm holding, holding it right here. But hope invites us and calls us to do more than just hold it. Hope calls us to do radical things because we believe, because we have it, because we know that we can't live without it. And we know that there's a world that can't live without it. And so instead of just holding on to it, we do something with it. We do something with it. I want to tell you about someone in the Bible. You've heard this story probably before, many of you. Someone who did something radical. And a lot of times radical things seem simple, but this is pretty radical to me. Mark 12, 41 through 44, that Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were being put, okay? So people were coming to the church, they were giving their offerings, and he watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. People were giving to the church. And many rich people came and they threw in large sums, large amounts. But a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins, worth only a few cents. Calling his disciples to him. So he sees this, right? He's like, hey, guys, come here. Jesus said, truly, I tell you, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. They gave out of their wealth, but she, 
out of her poverty, put in everything, all she had to live for, all she had to live on, all of it. See, these people said, oh, look at all this that I've got, and I'm going to take a little piece of this, which still looks like a lot to people, and I'm going to throw it down at the altar in front of everybody to show everybody how generous I am. But Jesus is saying, this woman who took the little she had and gave it all gave far more than the wealthy person. Even though their gift was bigger because they gave out of their wealth, they gave out of a little piece of what they thought like might be nice to give, but she took it all and laid everything down because she had hope that God saw her heart. She knew that the, the giving, she did something radical. She knew the giving. Uh, she, she wanted to see God's work done. Her heart was all in it, man. She wanted God more than anything else. She wanted God more than her next meal. And she didn't even have a man at home at that time to provide. She was a widow, nobody to provide for her. And she gave it all. The invitation of hope isn't just to hold it, it's to buy into it. To buy into it. And here's the thing, when you buy into something, you live by it. If you buy into it, you will live by it. I don't know why I'm hitting this workout ball. It's really, really nice right here. This is hope. When we buy into hope, we don't just talk about God's promises. We live them. We live them. And you know what? It's never, ever, 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 ever too late to buy into hope. It's never too late to say, you know what? I've been looking for hope in all the wrong places. I've been looking for wholeness in places that keep leaving me empty. It's never too late to find hope. Never, ever too late. And the thing about hope that's amazing is hope and faith, when we find the hope that Christ has for us, it doesn't just fill our lives. It causes us to live in ways that affects the world around us, and it becomes a legacy. Legacy. See, hope is a legacy we pass to our kids and our kids' kids to see generations of children who have hope. I want to tell you a story. In 1924, there was a boy named Edmund, born in Brooklyn, New York, his mother, Martha, didn't have the means to take care of him, so she placed Edmund and his brother in an orphanage in the Bronx. In the meantime, Martha earned money as a nanny for wealthy families, trying to earn enough money so that she could actually get her own boys back. She'd come visit her boys from time to time. And one of Edmund's last memories was his mom coming to take him out of the orphanage and go see the landing of the great Zeppelin they called the Hindenburg. Little did he know that he'd want to see one of the greatest modern day disasters take place as the Hindenburg crashed to the ground. Not long after that, Martha sadly died from what should have been a simple procedure and it left Edmund with very little hope to have a real home you know, he ran away constantly from every orphanage and every home they put him in. And one of the stories that Edmund would tell was he sat at the back of an orphanage yard and he would sit and watch as the trains went by. There was a set of railroad tracks and he said one day he would sit at the end and he uh, watched a train coming down the line. He could hear it, thump, 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 he'd say. He said, that day I thought, jump, 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 jump. He saw an empty coal car coming down the line, and as it passed, he took his first free fall into a train and took his free, first free ride across the northeast US. He became a train hopper. When Edmund turned 18, he was free, but he didn't have a home, family, or money, so he joined the Navy and ironically was given the job of landing zeppelins in the same airstrip where as a child he saw the Hindenburg crash. After some time, he was deployed as a gunman on a ship, shooting down kamikazes in World War II in several battles, including the invasion of Okinawa. In one battle, his ship was the only of a fleet that survived. 
Edmund was an artist, and he captured real-life battle scenes. It is drawings that are now displayed in the Eisenhower Museum. Edmund had a long list of incredible stories, from the orphanage to the war to designing and building his home with his own two hands. He married a beautiful woman named Betty, and they had three kids. They made a comfortable life for themselves. But still, there was something inside of his heart that was lacking in hope. He's still looking for something to fill the void. At the age of 49, his wife Betty dragged Edmund into a church against his will. Edmund said, I left angry. I was as mad as can be. I'm never going back. Everybody raising their hands and praising the Lord. He thought they were crazy. Somehow, Betty got him to go back. And at the age of 49, Edmund Hammett, my grandfather, gave his life to the Lord and decided to follow Jesus Christ. I had the chance to sit down with my grandfather and record me asking him some questions about his stories and his life. And he had a lot of incredible stories that we loved to hear. But when I asked him what was most important in his life, I want you to hear some of the answers that he gave me. Watch this video. I was 49 years old before Except the Lord. Anyway, that was my experience with the Holy Spirit and accepting Jesus Christ into my life. Best thing I ever did. It's just been wonderful. Grandpa, what would be your advice to young people, especially young couples? My advice to young couples would be find a, find a good church that preaches the gospel and preaches God's word and get born again. Being born again, a lot of people that I'm not familiar with the term. They kind of look at you twice like you're out of your tree. If you want a wonderful marriage of life, both, both you and your husband become one. That'd be my advice to a young couple. Grandpa, in light of everything you shared with me today, um, out of all your experiences in life, what would you hope that people would most remember you for? I hope they remember me of my Christian walk and... Uh, what I did with, with Jesus Christ when I was born again. One thing I'm really pleased with is, and I thank God tremendously for is all the grandkids and the grandchildren and the family, they're all, they all accepted the Lord. It's a Christian family. And uh, the Bible tells us that you and your household will be saved. Boy, the Lord sure answered that prayer. Each night when I go to bed, I Pray and thank the good Lord. I, uh... So my grandfather, Edmund Eddie, as they called him, went to bed for the last time on January 21st, 2018. I had the honor of singing with my brother at his funeral and some family members shared. And, uh... We asked if anybody else would be interested in standing up to share any stories. And um, a woman I, I didn't know stood up and she said, I, I want to share a word about Eddie. She said in 1978, her husband was 54 years old. And uh, my grandfather, Eddie, had only been a Christian for five years. She said her husband was, wheel, uh, was in a wheelchair. And he was disabled, and he'd been angry with God because he was confined to this chair for his whole life. And um, he was an atheist, didn't believe in God, didn't want anything to do with it. And, and this woman had found hope. She had given her life to Christ, and she wanted nothing more than to be a Christian family, but he wanted to hear nothing of it. She said one day she got stuck in her house because of a snowstorm. Nobody could go uh, where she was at to get out to church. And so she was discouraged. And so she turned on the radio to try to listen to the sermon. At that time, the sermons from the church were broadcast over WPOS, which is now Proclaim FM. And so she couldn't get the signal. And she said, I started to, to hear that the signal started to become clear. And she said, that morning I was able to listen to that sermon, but I didn't know two things. This is what she didn't know. She didn't know that on the other side of town, that my grandfather had climbed on top 
of the church in that snowstorm to hold the antenna in the right place so that people could hear the message that day. And what she also didn't know was that as that message came through the radio that day, her husband was in the room next door listening to every word. And God broke his heart, heart and he gave his heart to Jesus Christ that day when the message was delivered. She said, my whole life changed. Everything changed. Our family changed. It's what I'd always wanted. It's what I'd always hoped for. It was a hope fulfilled for her. And I see my grandfather, who was looking for that hope his whole life, and at 49, finally found it. And then he did something crazy, like cry, crawl on top of a roof during a snowstorm, uh, just so people could hear this same message. Hope causes us to do crazy things to pray crazy prayers. Hope causes us to give everything we have, even when we have nothing left, just so that other people can hear the message of hope that we have been given, that we hold on to, and that we go do something about, that we give it to the world. We're all forced at some point in time to figure out how much hope we have. How much hope do I have? I really did feel that. In September of 2010, I was asking myself, how much hope do I have when my son had his first open heart surgery? Just a baby, five days old. After surgery, we tried to get some sleep. And then we got a call at 2.13 AM. And they said, come quickly. His heart had stopped beating. We got there. And for 45 minutes, we watched the nurses and doctors try to save our son's life reaching through the open walls of his chest to pump his little heart and keep him alive. And I remember them pulling us away after 45 minutes. And in that moment, I remember knowing, I was like, man, it's over. It's over. But something inside of me just, I had hope still somehow. And I just remember praying this crazy prayer, just, Father, by the power of the death and resurrection of your son, Jesus Christ, please save mine. And I didn't know if he would answer my prayer. And then I remember just rocking over and over in this chair. And and all I could say was, Jesus, you are my treasure. You are my treasure. When sickness and death try to steal from me, nobody can take away my hope. You are my treasure. Moments later, I'll never forget when they came in and told us that Bowen's heart was beating again. And in that moment, I had my miracle. But here's the deal. I would have believed, I'm telling you, I would have believed that God was good even if I didn't get my miracle. But the beauty of it now is that I get to see this legacy of hope. My grandfather, at 49 years old, like I said, receiving that hope into his life, then he passed it on to his kids. I watched my parents faithfully serve the church in the midst of hardships and trials and splits and pastors leaving and heartache and losing friends. And they kept serving because they had hope. They passed that hope to me. I did stupid, crazy things like hop in a van and make no money and go out and try to share a message that I believed in at so much cost. And now, nine years later, three open heart surgeries later, And it's not just Bowen, but it's all my kids, my beautiful kids. I'm grateful for every single one of my kids. But now I get to pass the legacy of hope onto my kids. And one of the most amazing things that's happened for me over the past year of my life is to not only see my kids be amazing siblings to their little brother as he's gone through his third open heart surgery, but to watch my son Bowen write songs about hope as a nine-year-old as he goes into this surgery. And I would love, if it's OK with you guys, to, uh, to have Bone come up and sing a song about where his hope is. Would that be all right if I did that? <laughs> come on, buddy. I want to thank the worship team for letting me borrow their guitar. <laughs> Bone, are you ready for this, dude? So leading up to his uh, third open heart surgery this summer, You know, we worked on an album, and we finished up a few songs. um, And this is one of them. It's called Safe Right Here. Yep. I am going to be right. You are? Yeah.
job. Everybody. <laughs> Like, uh, man, I, uh, I, I know there's a new rock star in the family. I'm okay with it. I'm getting edged out here. It's all right. Happy to step aside. Um, I love it. I love it, man, to get the opportunity. Thanks for singing, Bo, and thanks to all my kids for being here. And we're excited to go see new baby Bennett our new cousin this afternoon. Here's the deal. Here's how I want to end. Um, I could put together like tidy little sermons and, uh, and that's good. That's good to give sermons. It's good to give talks and encourage people and use our voices to help people. But so often, um, you know, we think about how we can use our voice to give hope, but it just keeps coming back to me over and over that the only true, solid, lasting, forever hope that we have is in God and His Word. And so, um, you know, this verse, I want to read this verse. You know, it's, it, it's, it's already part of what I opened up with, but I want to read this whole verse in context. All people are like grass. And their faithfulness like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall because the breath of the Lord blows on them. Surely the people are just grass. (laughs) The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord our God endures forever. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary, increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. I was getting ready to speak at a marriage conference at Word of Life, which is a, a big organization. It's a camp uh, up in, in a Bible Institute up in um, uh, Adirondacks. And I was getting ready. Again, I had my little, my little stack of, of, of messages. And then I saw this little laminated card kind of peeking out at me. And I saw like, I was, okay, what's this? And I pulled it down. And it was just all this scripture saying who God says I am. And in all of my insecurity, did I prepare my message right? Am I giving the right messages? Are people going to like me? Am I going to say the right things? Am I, is it going to matter? I just read this card and I was like, Phew. so I'm going to read it to you. And I'm going to read all the things from God's word about who we are and the hope that we have. And that's how I just want to send you away today. So however you need to receive that, you can watch me as I read. You can close your eyes. You can look at the ground. Whatever you need to just listen and and soak this into your hearts. The enemy of your soul, the lie is this, that you are a sinner because you sin. God's truth is you are a saint. The enemy's lie is that your identity comes from what you have done, but God's truth is that your identity comes from what God has done for you. The enemy's lie is your identity comes from what people say about you. God's truth is that your identity comes from what God says about you. The enemy says your behavior tells you what to believe about yourself. God says your belief about yourself determines your behavior. Let's go on. This is what you are. This is what God's word said you are. You wonder why we have so much hope. Listen, Matthew 5, I'm the salt and light of the earth. John 15, I'm a branch of the true vine. John 15, 16, I've been chosen to bear fruit. Acts 1, I'm a personal witness of Christ. 1 Corinthians 3, I am God's temple. 2 Corinthians 5, I'm a minister of reconciliation for God. 2 Corinthians 6, I am God's co-worker. Ephesians 2, 6, I am seated with Christ in the heavenly realm. Ephesians 2, 10, I am God's workmanship. From Ephesians 3, I may approach God with freedom and confidence. 
John 1, I am God's child. John 15, I am Christ's friend. Romans 5, I have been justified. 1 Corinthians 6, I'm united with the Lord. 1 Corinthians 6, 19, I'm bought with a price. I belong to God. From 1 Corinthians 12, I'm a member of Christ's body. Ephesians 1, I am a saint. Ephesians 1, 5, I've been adopted as, a, as God's child. Ephesians 2, I have access to God through the Holy Spirit. Colossians 1, I've been redeemed and forgiven. Colossians 2, I am complete in Christ. Romans 8, I am free forever from condemnation. I'm assured that all things work together for the good. I am free from any charge against me. I cannot be separated from God's love. 2 Corinthians, I'm established, anointed, sealed by God. Colossians 3, I'm hidden with Christ in God. Philippians 1, 6, what God has begun in me will be perfected. Philippians 3, I'm a citizen of heaven. 2 Timothy 1, I've not been given a power, a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and sound mind. Hebrews 4, I can find grace and mercy in my time of need. 1 John 5, I am born of God. The evil one cannot touch me. Can not touch me. Philippians 14, 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. He is our hope. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for the opportunity we have to just partake in hope like a good, healthy meal today. God, we're just, we're so grateful that that you feed our spirits and our hearts. You want to do more of that for us. Help us just embrace your hope in our lives. Help us receive hope not only for our own lives. Help us receive hope as a legacy that we give to others in the way that we even give towards this new building, God, that we build a space where we can give more people hope. We can bring more people in to hear from your word, to hear what you have to say about their lives. I'm so tired of hearing the lies that culture tells us about who we are when we can find who we really are in you. We want to give that hope to the world, God, but before we can make it come alive in us. Help us receive it so that we're willing to do some radical things to change the world. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Can we give Matt a big hand today? Yeah. What a great word today, and I love that hope. One of the parts of Matt's message I loved hearing was the story of his grandpa. At the age of 49, he knew that, hey, I needed something else in my life. I needed hope, and he asked Jesus into his life, and his life was changed. And today, I want to take some time to do that. So why don't you take some, just bow our heads and close our eyes here. If that's you today, and you say, hey, I need hope today. I need a relationship with Jesus. Just raise your hand today. You say, I want that. There's many hands going up today. You know, it's not too late. I want that hope. That is you today. Just raise your hand. Keep it up there. What we're going to do, we're going to pray, all of us in this room today, and I just want you to repeat after me. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for today. I thank you for your son, Jesus. I believe, Jesus, you came to this earth and died on a cross for my sins. I ask you, Jesus, to come into my heart and wash away my sins and let me live a life for you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Let's give everybody a hand that raised their hand today. Awesome, praise God. What I'm going to ask on your way out, you can find these on our back wall. One of these cards, this is I have decided. Take some time and fill it out and take that to our Connection Center. We have a team in there that would love to pray with you and give you a Bible today. You know, and if you're saying you're here today and you say, hey, I'm, I just need some prayer today, you can head to the Connection Center there and we'll have a team again that will pray with you for any needs you have there. I encourage you to stop in the atrium, stop by Matt's table, pick up this book, meet Bowen, and I encourage you to be back here next Sunday for Vision Sunday. Have a great week. Thank you.